ان الحمد لله ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد يا عباد الله اوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله my dear respected brothers and sisters we start first and foremost by praising allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the king the master the creator the source the essence he is the one that gives life he is the one that takes life he is the one that sustains everything depends on him he depends on nothing everyone relies on him he relies on nobody we praise allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we say that all praise is due to allah because praising anything other than allah is injustice towards allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you imagine the one that creates and then i praise the creation where's the logic so all peace and blessings all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we send peace and blessings upon his beloved and his favorite and the best creation of his and that is our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My dear respected brothers and sisters, I remind myself and I remind you all to have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the fear that he is most deserving of. The fear of Allah, my brothers, is different to the fear of anything else. Because the fear of anything else, when I fear something, I naturally run away from this thing that I fear. But the fear of Allah is different. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fafirru illallah. He says, and run, run where? He says, run to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the fear of Allah. That I run back to Him. I don't run away from Him. My dear respected brothers, there is a beautiful story that I want to share with you. And I'm sure, yani, I'm sure most of you have heard this story is mentioned in al Israeliyat. It was made famous by no other than uh, made famous by no other than Sheikh Yusuf Estes. And the story has it that uh, Jesus Isa alayhi salatu was salam was traveling with his companions. He was traveling with his companions, so they got hungry. So they collected some money and he gave some money to one of his companions and he says to the companion, he says to him, go into the town and buy us some food. So this companion grabs the money, goes into town and all that the money could buy was three loaves of bread. But his hunger was so much so that he couldn't wait to get back. So he smashed one of the loaves, came back with two. So when he comes back to Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, Jesus says to me, says to him, who ate the third loaf? The man to his utter shock system, but there was only two. So he didn't want to argue with the man. They traveled. After some time, they were successful in hunting a deer. They hunted the deer, they killed it, they cooked it, they ate it. And as they sat around this carcass, as they sat around whatever was left of it, which was basically bones, Isa alayhi salatu was salam, he asks Allah and by Allah, through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gave life back to the deer and the deer came back to life and ran away. And this happened in front of them. So he turns to the man and says to him, I'm asking you by the one who gave life to this deer, who ate that third loaf? The man insisted, he says, but there was only two. So they didn't argue and they continued. As they traveled, they came to what was a flooded river, a river that they had to cross. So they get to the flooded river and Isa alayhi salatu was salam, he asks his companions, he says to them, let's all gather and we'll all hold hands. And he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by the qudra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he allowed them to walk on the surface of the river. Then they get to the other side. And this was a miracle. So he turns to the man and he says to him, I'm asking you, by the one that allowed us to walk on the face of this river, who ate that third loaf? The man insisting. 
He says, but there was only two. They continued on. After they reached, they reached a particular area, Isa alayhi salatu was salam, he sits down and he collects three piles of dirt. Three piles of dirt. And then through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he turns the dirt into gold. So he says to the man, he says to him, one pile is for you, one pile is for me, and that third pile is for the one that ate the third loaf of bread. So the man immediately jumps and said, I ate it. He said, he said, I ate it. He says to him, then you take all three, but you can no longer accompany us anymore. This is where our journey ends. So the man, yani, now overtaken by his new fortune, couldn't care less. So he sits back and he's looking at his new found fortune. Not long after, three thieves. Three? Three thieves came. They see the man with the gold and the first thing that came was they killed the man. There's gold. Three of us, there's one of him. So they killed the man. But they were hungry too. So they spoke amongst one another. And one of them said, listen, I'll go into town and I'll grab some food. The other agrees. The other two agreed. So the man took off heading in towards town and he's planning against the other two. The other two said, this is a perfect opportunity to plan against him. So he says, I'll go into town, I'll buy some food and I'll poison it. The other two said, look, on his return, we'll kill him and we'll split his share in half. So the man goes into town, buys the food, poisons the food. On his return, before he could do anything, they killed him. They sat to eat their food and soon after they both died. Some time passed and then Isa alayhi salatu was salam, walking along with his companions walks back. And sees all four men laying on the ground. Their former companion and the three thieves. And the three piles of gold were left untouched. So he turns to his companions and he says to them, this is the life of this world. This is Hayat al-Dunya. It was the love of this world that destroyed all four. And it is the love of this world that is destroying every single one of us in this room today. Especially the man that stands before you. So, no, brother, me, I billah. I don't love wealth. Allah says in the Quran, وَتُحِبُّونَ الْمَالَ حُبًّا جَمَّا Allah says, verily, you love wealth. You're clinging on. We're clinging on to rubbish. We're clinging on to that which will be left. We're hanging on to that which will go nowhere. And it's killing every single one of us. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Yatba'ul mayyata thalatha. He says, three things will follow you to the grave. He says, Ahluhu wa maluhu wa amaluhu. He says, three things will follow you, my brother, to the grave. He says, your family, your wealth, and your a'mal. He says, two things will come back and only one thing will remain with you there. Brother, paint it how you want. This is the reality because Rasulullah he doesn't speak from his own vain desires. Rather, what he speaks is revelation from Allah. And you try this, I've tried it many times when you go to the funeral and I remember asking myself, how does your wealth follow you to the grave? So I remember one time, someone in the area, no need to mention names, some big timer, was shot. And naturally, يعني, at the mosque, all the boys, all the tats, all the big gold chains, the Gucci hats, uh, the Lamborghini Gallardo parked outside. And this all followed him to the grave. The money went. The Louis Vuitton shoes and the, and the, and the, and the, you know, and the brightling watches with the diamond bezels. And so all of this followed the man to the grave. 
They buried the man. 20 minutes later, everyone's walking away. And sure, where are we going to go eat? What are we going to do? What, what? The family sat there, made dua, a couple of tears, walked back. And what was he left with, my brother? Nothing. He was left with nothing. He was left with his amal. If he did good, he will verily see. And if he did bad, he will surely see. My brothers, the love of this world, Wallah al -Azim, it's crippling us. This heart, you know, Wallahi, I went to Hajj this year. And Alhamdulillah, I've been on deen for I don't know how long. And, you know, in and out and lessons and sitting with my shaykh and whatever have you. But even on the day of Arafat, I struggled. I absolutely struggled to get a tea. Just one tea. I want something to fall. Nothing. Because this heart can only take so much. And this heart, instead of filling it up with the love of Allah, I filled it up with the love of this dunya. So I'll give you an example. I want you to imagine now one of the brothers bought a Mercedes Benz, bought a brand new car, whatever it is, bought a brand new car, parked it in the driveway, and the next morning, the car's gone. So automatically we're going to ask, brother, you insured? And we're holding on to the reply. If he says yes, alhamdulillah. If he says no, yeah, but yeah, your heart is going to burn. So when the brother says to you, no, brother, the Mercedes Benz wasn't insured. Oh, my heart. Oh, you could just cry. But the brother's been missing Fajr for 10 years. And you haven't moved an inch because of it. Rasulullah he says, not Fajr, forget Fajr. He says, the Sunnah of Fajr, the Sunnah, those two ruka' is worth more than the world and what it contains. And the Ummah is missing it day after day, day after day. No problems. It's only Sunnah. But if a piece of metal wrapped around some fancy leather, if that was to be taken away from the man, <laughs> that hurts. Why? Because this heart, my brother, has been filled with the love of this world. And it hasn't been filled with the love of Allah. We understand the value of the Mercedes Benz. We understand the value of a brightly watch. I understand the value of a Gucci hat. But I have nothing, absolutely nothing, no understanding, no comprehension whatsoever for the way of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's why it's easy. That's why it's easy. You know, today, naturally, Gaza, whatever's happening, you know, you have to touch on Gaza. Well, I, I don't know how to speak politics. I really cannot comprehend it. What do I, like, really, where do I start? Where do I start to talk to you about Gaza? If the heart that's going to tell you about Gaza is indulged in this dunya, then what chance is there for Gaza? If the people that are going to be listening about what's happening to Gaza are swimming, absolutely swimming in the love of this world, then what chance does Gaza, forget Gaza, anything else in the world have a chance? Nothing. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's sitting down with his companions. And my brother, really, yani, let's just sort of give me your heart, give me your mind and your imagination, and let's try to live the moment. Let's try to live the moment. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is sitting there with his companions. And Rasulullah and the companions, they say that we were given the quality of fee, the distance of one month. The distance of one month. Yani their enemy would be marching and they still have a month to reach the Muslims and already the fee of the Muslims would enter their hearts. Already. The Muslims were generally speaking, generally speaking, outnumbered. Right? The enemy always had more men, more advanced men, more trained men, more military weaponry, more money, more technology, more everything. And yet, with just the thought of having to face the Muslims, the fear used to enter their heart the distance of one month. So you imagine, Rasulullah is speaking to a people who knew very well, who knew... But imagine Khalid bin Walid, a man who... The Christians or the kafar at the time, they used to scare their kids. You know, like now when you, you know, in a, 
I'm going to call Bu'adli or, or, or whatever it is. You want to scare your kid with something, right? And they'll do this or I'm going to call. They used to scare their kids with Khalid bin Walid. Umar bin Khattab, Umar anhu, a woman was summoned to see him. He summons the woman to come see him. He was Amir al Mu'mineen. He needed to speak to the woman. So the people came to her and said to her, Look, Umar bin Khattab is asking for you. So she says, Oh my, what does he want from me? They said, We don't know. He wants to talk to you. So she started to panic. She says, But why me? What does he want to speak to me for? They said to her, We don't know. He's asking. On the way to say Umar al Khattab, she lost her baby. She was pregnant. She lost him. The fear of having to stand before the man who was Muslim and she was Muslim, the fear of she lost her baby. So you imagine that Rasulullah is speaking to these men. He says to them that there's going to come a time. There's going to come a time when the enemies of Allah will come together like you come towards a sufra. Have you ever been to a fancy dinner? Nice big sufra. You know, the mansaf, the roast, the chicken, the pizza. He says, they will come like you go towards the sufra. And they will sit. And the conversation will be, you take this part of the ummah, and you take this part of the ummah, and I'll do this with that, and I'll do... So the companions were amazed. We, a prophet of Allah, we the Muslims, this will happen to us. The enemies will come together in this fashion. He says to him, yes. So one of them naturally couldn't comprehend. So he jumps up, he says, a prophet of Allah. And he's thinking already we're little in number and we're smashing. We're little in number and we're dominating. So he's thinking a prophet of Allah, will we be that little? Are we going to be so few in number that we can't even defend ourselves? He says, no. No, 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 no. He says, but antum kathir, you will be heaps. In fact, he gives the example of the froth of the sea. Millions upon millions. Millions of Muslims. I was, I don't know, 1.6, 1 1.7 billion. Is that even a figure anymore? 1.7 billion. So the companions, Allahu Akbar, like you're putting salt to the wound. So you're telling us we're great in number, yet this is still going to happen. So they asked, why, O Prophet of Allah, why is this going to happen? He says to them, because verily, wahan will enter the heart. So this word wahan is not an Arab term. So the companions, and he looked at each other and said to him, O Prophet of Allah, what is wahan? What's this wahan that you're referring to? He says to him, hubb dunya wa karahiyatul mawt. When this quality enters your heart, when you love this world and what it contains, and you cannot even bear the thought of death, your enemy will do this to you. Yani if, if, wallahi, sometimes I think this hadith came out last week. It's not 1400 years old. It's so relative. It's so relative. It's almost like Rasulullah said it a week ago. He says, because the quality of wahan will enter the heart. You will love this world and you will hate to die. When the Muslims were conquering the Roman Empire, imagine, imagine these Muslims were Arabs, Bedouins, they were barbarians. They lived in an area that nor the Persians nor the Romans wanted it. Yani. It was dead, no man's land. What are you going to do with them? They're Arabs. They, 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 they eat the dead. Yani, what are we going to do with them? So when these people started dominating the Roman Empire, naturally the Empress thinking, what is going on? How are we the people that were peasants? They were, they were nothing. How are we the greatest empire the world ever knew? How are we losing to these men? So he pulls up one of his generals. He says to him, what's going on? So the general buckles. So he says to him, uh, uh, do they have more weaponry than us? He says to him, no. He says to him, do they have more money? He says to him, no. He says, are they more trained? Are they more advanced than us? He says to him, no. He says, then what's going on? <laughs> what's going on? How are we losing? He says to him, 
can I speak freely? He says, to speak for crying out loud, we're losing. He says, how can you destroy an army that loves to die like you love to live? H how? What, are you going to use scare tactics? Where do you start? Where do you start? My brothers, the love of this world is crippling this ummah. It's crippling us. We have forgotten Allah and His Prophet. And we're more concerned with Caesar stone. Or do you think we should go for granite? Do you think we should go for granite, brother? Or, or? Well, and I, look, um, and I spoke to my wife the other day and, and um, I think we've agreed on this color. This heart, my brother, is crying for Allah. This heart is crying for Allah. But we're drowning it with the love of this world. We're drowning it, my brothers. And it's killing us all. إن الحمد لله نحمد ونستعين ونصلي على الحبيب محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم. إن شاء الله brothers if I can get you guys to move forward because there's brothers standing on the door. So please if we can just move forward إن شاء الله just so the brothers can come in. Brothers please come in. Please just tell the boys outside to. So my brothers. I think the golden question now is, okay, so where to now? Where do you start? My brothers, wallahi, there's, there's got to be a million theories. I'm sure if you grab the 100,000 ulama and told them, okay, give us a solution, I'm sure you're going to come up with 100,000 different solutions. My brothers, the most practical one that comes to mind is first and foremost, we need to start turning towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we need to start making some serious changes in our lives. Some serious changes. We need to turn back to Allah. And we need to turn back to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he reveals to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, Al-yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum. He says, O oh Muhammad, today your religion, my religion has been made complete. You know, a Jew came to Umar ibn al-Khattab. He says to him, Oh, Umar, there's a verse in your Quran. Listen to this Jew. Yeah, subhanAllah, man. He says to Umar ibn al Khattab, he says to him, uh, Umar, there's a verse in your Quran. If it was revealed to us, we would have made its day of revelation a Eid. I remember hearing this story automatically. I started thinking, Oh, which verse? Which, which? Not Umar ibn al Khattab, mate, no. So Umar ibn al-Khattab didn't give him a chance to breathe. He says to him, O Jew, I know which verse you speak of. You say you would have made its day of revelation, Eid. I tell you, its day of revelation is two Eids for us. It was revealed on the day of Jum'ah, which is Eid. And it was revealed on the one and only Hajj of Muhammad, وسلم, which is another Eid for us. He says, the verse you speak of is That today your religion has been perfected, it's been completed. And I have bestowed my, my mercy upon you and my favors upon you. And I have chosen Islam as my way and my religion. So why is this verse so important? Because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes such a statement, He's saying that your religion has been perfected. Whether you live in stone ages, whether you live in the rocket ages, no matter what ages you live in, your answer, your solution to whatever harm, to whatever, whatever mishap, whatever difficulty comes your way, your answer, your solution is the deen of Allah and the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And if you look and if you turn towards anything else, then Allah himself will disgrace you. 
Don't wait for the Jew to... Allah Himself is going to disgrace you because you opted for something other than His way. You opted for something other than the way of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This, Allah Himself will disgrace you. So our answer to any problem, be it yourself, be it your couple as a you know, husband and wife, be it as a family, be it as a community, be it as a country, be it as an ummah at large, any problem that comes our way, our solution is the deen of Allah and His Prophet. Anything else, you're going downhill, Habib. Paint it however you want. We came to change the world. We have the answers for the misery of the world. But the Muslims have left the way of Muhammad and they've turned to other means. My brothers, my time is short. I want to leave with this hadith. And this hadith, in essence, Rasulullah is speaking about da'wah, giving da'wah. But why is this relative? You'll understand when I say it. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says in the authentic hadith, he says, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ Look how he starts. يعني automatically, he's hit you for a six. Rasulullah sallallahu is taking oath by Allah, he says, by the one whom my life is in his hands. Does Rasulullah sallallahu need to take an oath? Does he? Does he need to say to me, Wallahi, this, no. مَا هِي صَادِقِ الْأَمِينِ He says, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ لَتَأْمُرُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَلَا تَنْهَوُنَّ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ He says, you will enjoy good and you will forbid that which is evil, meaning da'wah. You will get out there, you will be active, you will be talking about Allah, you will be talking about the humility of this world, you will be talking about death, you will be talking about His Prophet. You will give da'wah, you will stop that which is wrong, you will, you will enjoy that which is good. He says, لَتَأْمُرُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَلَا تَنْهَوُنَّ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ أو لا يوشكن الله أن يبعث عليكم عقابا من. He says if you don't do this, then verily Allah will send down a punishment upon you. ثم تدعون له. فلا يستجاب لكم. He says and when this punishment will come upon you, you will raise your hands to make dua to him, and Allah will not accept your dua. My brothers, there was 5 million people in Hajj this year who raised their hands and cried, cried, cried. Oh Allah, this Ummah, oh Allah, Syria, oh Allah, Palestine. Cried, they bawled their eyes out. Yet Allah hasn't answered their dua. I want to ask you, and excuse me for being a bit vulgar, yani. is Allah deaf? Yani? Allah can't hear their cries? Huh? Is Allah blind? Allah couldn't see him? A'udhu Billah. But there's a condition, my brother, that you need to fulfill before Allah can answer that dua. So my brothers, our answer is clearly, purely turning back towards the deen of Allah and the sunnah of His beloved Prophet. My dear respected brothers, um, I believe tomorrow is Ashura. Yeah? Tomorrow is Ashura, depending on calendar. If you go off moon sighting, you'll need to check. Regardless, Rasulullah has encouraged the Ummah to fast Ashura, which is tomorrow of moon sighting, then you'll need to check with the moon sighting. And he وسلم, encouraged us to fast the day before it, which is today. Now, if some of you haven't fasted, then he said you can fast Ashura and fast the day after it. So you fast Saturday and Sunday. Okay? And I believe the virtue of this is, is he, will, he, he will forgive you one year previous years. Allahu alam. He will forgive one previous year of sin. Ashura. Right? This is going to undo the Shia. Ashura is com completely something else. So my brothers, this is happening tomorrow. My brothers, you now, because really what usually happens is we sit for the khutbah. MashaAllah. The brother was pumped. It was very, very, very nice. And then we walk out that door and we start talking about dunya. Sure, when are kaza, and then the khutbah is gone five minutes later. This is why we're drowning. We need to 
proactively walk out of this and ask yourself, what am I going to do with this khutbah? What am I going to do with this knowledge that I've just gained? With this perspective that I've just heard? What am I going to do with it? He says, if you don't give da'wah, what will happen? You will raise your hands and your du'a will not be heard. So my brother, you have a job. Rather than talking about where you're going and what you're coming, when you walk outside, talk to the brother. Tell him, brother, what was your perspective on that khutbah? What did you understand? Talk, talk. When you go home to your wife, tell her about the khutbah. When you sit with your kids, tell them. When you go back to work, speak. Talk, brother, talk. Talk, share it. Let this heart move. This is an amana now that's upon every single one of you. Are you all ready for this? You all ready for this? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all. Nasa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and yaghfir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat al ahya'i wal amwat. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to return this ummah back to his deen back to the full sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give victory to the Muslims wherever they are. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take the love of this rubbish bin, take the love of this rubbish bin out of our hearts and put the love of Allah and his beloved Prophet into the heart. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from the people of Firdaus al-A'la. We ask, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of the people who on the day of judgment, there's no accountability for them. There is no hisab. We go straight into Jannah bi idnillahi ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make Jahannam haram upon us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enlighten this ummah and once again bring us back to his beloved deen. Wa nusalli ala al-habib Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Kumul li salatikum yarhamni wa yarhamukum Allah. Taqaddam, taqaddam.